So now we're still on the second leg, as it were, of the integration path to God. First being interest, but second being what you learn. Okay? Now that's true of anything in life. What you learn about a person is going to affect your interest in that person. What you learn about your job is going to affect your interest in that job. What you learn about anything is going to affect your interest in it. Okay? Like, you know, a whole lot of people, for example, got all ticked off that the head of Firefox, who was only the head for two weeks, had six years prior donated some money to some Proposition 8 thing in California, which was about, you know, against same-sex marriage. Six years ago, he gave a $1,000 and two, you know, $500 deposits prior to him becoming CEO of Firefox. The guy's last name was Ike, E-I-C-H. Because he did that six years prior to becoming head of Firefox, a whole lot of people got together and signed a petition, 70,000 people, to get rid of him as head of Firefox, and they succeeded. So, interest. They were interested in Firefox very clearly, but their interest paled and turned negative when they found out that the guy who was CEO of Firefox, six years prior to becoming CEO of Firefox, for God knows what reason, made a donation to a cause that those 70,000 people didn't like. And for that reason, they were against Firefox. So their interest in Firefox was what? Conditional. On what? What they thought Firefox ought to be as the CEO. So were they really interested in Firefox, the product? Apparently not. Apparently their interest in the product was so low that it could be turned off by what they imagined was this guy's own interest in a political cause they didn't like. It doesn't matter what the cause was, but I'm just giving you real facts you can check on the internet. Okay, so they learned, in their minds, they learned something about this guy that made them turn against Firefox unless Firefox got rid of the guy, which Firefox did. Now, there are a lot of implications and a lot of issues that you can argue about that question. But the point is, is their actual interest in the product Firefox was conditional on something else on their idea of what Firefox ought to espouse as a political position. So their actual interest in Firefox itself for what it did for them was zero. That's the same kind of thing that happens with God or anybody else. You are interested in somebody based on what you think they are and then you start to learn things about that person and based on what you learn your interest changes now if you're learning false things or you're learning things that appeal to you that don't have anything to do with the person but you want to make an issue of the thing that you learned as if it had to do with the person then you're interested in that thing that you learned not the person. And this is the way it goes in Christian life. A lot of Christians will stop believing in Christ by the time they're dead because their interest in Him is really geared to their expectation that He will treat them a certain way. And when He doesn't treat them a certain way, the way they expect, they lose interest in Him. And therefore they stop learning Him. By the same token, it's just in normal Christian life, and there's plenty of this in the Bible, 
you start out interested in God and you have a certain idea about what God's like, and then you start coming to some really problematic Bible passages. Like the fact that he wiped out all of Sennacherib's army, or he wiped out all the people of AI, or the Holocaust. And it's like, why did God let that happen? Your grandma, your grandpa gets sick and dies. Why God let that happen? See, if God is so good that I believe in this God and I'm interested in this God by a definition of good that I have, and then I find out stuff in the Bible or in life, and he didn't conform to that definition, then my interest is impacted. And right at this moment, what I'm presuming is that you're learning things that are actually true. It's true that your uncle or your aunt or your grandma or your grandpa got sick and died. And it's true that God allowed that. It's true that he wiped out the people of AI. It's true that he wiped out Sennacherib's army. It's true that he allowed the Holocaust. Those are all facts. We're not talking about skewed doctrine here. We're not talking about falsehood here. We're not talking about hallucinated ideas Okay, that are passed off as being really of God. These are these are facts. And they affect your interest. Now, one of the measures of your interest is whether you're interested in God for himself or you're interested in God for what you want him to be or you're interested in God based on an idea that you think is true, what happens when those ideas are contradicted? Do you really have an interest in God or is it the interest in the idea of God that you are enamored of? And that's true with all other relationships, too. Is it the person? Or is it your idea of the person? Is it your idea of the job? Is it your idea of the topic that you're really interested in? And that's a constant test all throughout life, and especially in learning Scripture. Because there's a whole lot of stuff in Scripture that's just plain difficult to even know what it is. And then once you know what it is, it's like, why is this in the Bible? Why is 50% of the Bible spent on architecture? Because it really pretty much is. Maybe you can argue it's not 50%, maybe it's like 35. But a good 30, you know, most of the Old Testament, all the book of Deuteronomy, a whole bunch of the book of Numbers, a good part of the Exodus is based on ceremonies and rules and rituals and they're all related to the structure of the temple, the architecture. All of Ezekiel 40 is based on the architecture of the temple. Why? Why is so much of the Bible going on and on and on and on and on and on and on about things nobody knows anything about today? And it's supposed to be the Bible, it's supposed to be the Word of God, we're supposed to learn it. Well, why? There are a lot of very troubling questions that arise as you learn scripture. Why is it this hard to learn? Why is it this irrelevant on the surface? Why are we supposed to learn it in order to know God? How does this verse in the Bible tell me something about God when it's about Abraham said something to Sarah? It's Abraham and Sarah. It's not God. And of course, that's why I said in, in, in the last increment, the most important thing you can do in order to protect your interest from misintegration and disintegration is to keep talking to God about everything. Because it's not just about what you learn in Bible class, and that's very, very difficult. Because the world just doesn't respect that at all. It pays lip service to it, but doesn't respect it. Learning about the Bible is difficult enough. The stuff in the Bible seems totally irrelevant most of the time. And why do you have to learn it? And how does it actually relate to the character of God? What is it telling you about the character of God? 
it's there to tell you the character of God. Every single jot and tittle of the Bible is there for that purpose. Okay, but the same can be said for your life. Everything about your life tells you something about God. What? Because it sure doesn't seem to be telling you anything about anything except that, hi, I got to do this email, I got to wash the dishes, I got to give Johnny a haircut, I have to fix dinner. How is that telling you anything about God? How are you going to know? If you're interested in learning something about God, then you have to assume that if God created it all, it's all some kind of expression of his character. And therefore, everything does relate to him in some manner. What is it? If you're interested enough in him as a person, irrespective of what your ideas might be of him, you're going to ask. So all throughout your day, whether it's inside Bible class or in the rest of Bible class, which is the other 23 hours a day, which is in what you're doing with your life, just keep on asking, well, how does this relate to you? Even if you know you you know the answer, ask it again. Okay? How is what I'm going through relating to you right now? What am I learning about you? What does this say about you? How are you in this and why do you like it? Anything that keeps on asserting a vertical relationship to God, because it is there, about whatever you rightly know or don't rightly know because whatever you rightly know you need to know better and whatever you don't rightly know you need to correct so that you actually know God not your hallucination of him not the world's hallucination of him you see the point the most important thing you can do if, if you want to do this, okay, forget right, wrong, forget good person, bad person, forget the trial, forget Satan, forget all that stuff. Do you want to know God or not? And if so, do you want to know the real God or a hallucinated idea of God? And if you want to know the real God, then somehow everything has to reflect him. No matter how irrelevant it might seem. And no matter how much you know about how it might reflect him, you don't know enough. So what is this saying about you, God? What am I learning about you, God? All day long. Two habits. One John, one nine like breathing and looking to God and asking questions. You get into those two habits, then what's going to happen is, first of all, your integration will, will speed up. You won't notice it because there's so much to integrate. Okay? It'll speed up. It'll become a habit of your thinking so that it becomes like breathing, automatic. One John, one nine becomes automatic even in your sleep, eventually. Okay? Same thing true for this question with God. How does this relate to you? You're watching a movie. How does that relate to him? If you become interested in God for himself, just to know him, but just that's it. That's all. That's the whole purpose of life. That's all you care about. Maybe it isn't all you care about, but you are. You do care. You keep doing that, and that's going to build that vertical, and that will protect you from staying stuck on anything. If you've got a wrong idea about God, he'll correct you out of it. So it doesn't matter what denomination you are. It doesn't matter what false doctrines you believe in right now. If you're interested in God, he'll take you out of that. It won't be tomorrow. It won't be the next day. It won't be immediate. But he'll take you out of that. You don't have to worry about it. And you want to also avoid being stuck on your increasing competence in knowing him. Because the competence itself is a sort of distraction. The pleasure of having competence in knowing him itself is a distraction. And this is where a lot of, especially your Christian academia, academics, get tied up. They become competent at Bible, but they're not competent at knowing God. They get stuck on the competence of Bible and they, they, they end up thinking that their competence in Bible means they're competent at knowing God. 
but they really aren't even if they correctly tell you about God because they're actually just stuck on the Bible competence they got it's very subtle this divergence away from integration with God so you're going to end up as you go through your Christian life becoming very competent at understanding scripture you don't want to get sidetracked into that competence okay because the objective is to know God not to be competent you want to be competent in order to know God so you do have a desire for competence but as that desire gets met it's real easy to be stuck on the enjoyment of the dis of the competence itself rather than knowing him so you never as it were rest on your laurels of competence in knowing him and you always realize well there's something better to know and oh yes I enjoy my competence in knowing you God but it's you not the competence so if you keep asking questions what am I learning what am I learning about you what does this say about you just because you want to know then you're gonna you're gonna avoid a lot of the pitfalls that occur accrue to Christians who actually are into learning Bible as a spiritual life it is a spiritual life but it has its own pitfalls one of which is becoming competent at it and getting hung up on your competence and you don't even know that you got sidetracked and you don't even know that now all of a sudden you're misintegrating and therefore disintegrating in your knowledge of God now I can't close this without making a final caveat it's real easy to therefore get very anal about I want to know you I'm using 1 John 1 9 I'm asking you questions as if that itself were a kind of catechism and that you're a bad person if you're not oh I, I, I just went through 60 minutes and I didn't ask God about himself oh I'm a bad person now you now you're misintegrating it's got to be a natural desire it's got to be something you really want not something you do in order to feel good about yourself that's another misintegration that people get into that's how the whole thing with Catholicism got started is they were trying to do an integration thing where they were integrating things you did in your life with things about God that's why the mass is structured the way it is and people got into the motions the same thing happened under the Mosaic law things people got into the motions and they deemed themselves good persons or bad persons because of the way they did the motions and it stopped being about God at all you can get in that same kind of ropeness that same kind of catechism when you go through this thing of oh I forgot to use 1 John 1 9 okay so use it oh I, I didn't ask God about why you know how this related to him okay so are you interested to ask him now yes no no I'm not interested okay yes I am interested okay well then ask I'm just saying that if you want to know God these two things will protect you but they won't protect you if you turn them into their own religion if you turn your competence in learning Bible and this happens a lot in my church people just would order tapes and order tapes and order tapes and they listen 30 40 50 times lessons and they wouldn't do anything else and finally the church had to make a rule don't listen for more than an hour a day and they restricted the amount of tapes you can get for that reason so that it would be harder to OD because you can get religious about it oh I want to know Bible I want to know Bible and it's day in day out day in day out you know 10 12 15 hours a day and unless you're a pastor you're really not supposed to spend that much time and even if you're a pastor you gotta pace yourself because they were getting religious about knowing Bible and it really wasn't about God their motive was to know God they meant well but they got sidetracked the same thing can happen here 
as long as you want to know God, you're going to be fine. But make sure it's a genuine interest. You genuinely want to know. I mean, I don't know. Maybe you like living the way you're living. But I don't particularly like the business of life. I got to brush my teeth. That is, to me is a boring activity. I got to compose an email. And, you know, that's partly a boring activity. If I'm interested in the topic, I don't mind. But you see the point? If you're not interested in something, or your interest is low, or you perceive the productivity of what you're doing is low, then it's dissatisfying to you. It's more satisfying to do my brush my teeth if I can associate it with something with God. Then all of a sudden, the green peas of brushing my teeth are associated with the ice cream of learning something about God. So I'm doing it because it's more enjoyable. Okay? If I'm doing it, however, to think well of myself, or, oh, now I spent a productive moment, I learned something about God, and, oh, see, I, I did the right thing. Well, that screws it up. See, in God, righteousness is actually something he loves. To, to God, righteousness is ice cream. He'll do anything to get it. He just loves it that much. He's not doing it so that he can call himself right. He's not doing it so he can say he did the right thing. He's doing it because it tastes good to him. So I guess the litmus of this whole thing, your interest and what you learn are two, like, you know, um, think of a, a V for victory. You've got to have your interest and you've got to have the content of what you're learning about God running side by side and they have to feed each other. But it has to be genuine interest. If it's not, don't sweat it. Just recognize that's what it is. Don't do it because you have to. Because then you're learning a have to, a must, an ought to, instead of a desire. In God, righteousness is a desire. It is not a have to. He did not create righteousness as a have to. He lays down laws for children who have no desires, who have no thought pattern, who have no knowledge and understanding. Do this, do this, do this, do this. That's what you do with your children. Because your children don't know how to desire anything yet. They don't know what good is. Good and desire are supposed to be part and parcel of the same thing. The sin nature messes that up, so we have to have a lot of do's and a lot of rules. But in God, that's not how it works. In God, he loves righteousness. It tastes good to him like most every human being on the planet loves ice cream. And different flavors, maybe. But I, I don't know a single human being on this planet that wouldn't like ice cream if they tried it. Depending on what flavor they like. To God, righteousness is ice cream. We need to get to the place where that's the way it is for us, too. And it starts with wanting to know Him because He tastes good to you. And when you run across many day, times a day stuff in life or stuff in Scripture that makes God sound like He doesn't taste so good, then you ask. Or, if it's really a tasty portion of scripture to you, or a tasty thing that just happened in your life, ask, oh wow, God, this is tasty. Thank you. Well, what, what am I learning about you in this thing? Because, I mean, it's already tasty to me. Why is it tasty to you? Just because you want to know. See? Now, in real life, the people who make it in life, and all their Bible heroes are in this class, they really just wanted to know. That was what made life tasty to them, was knowing how God thought about it, was knowing how it related to God. If that's how it is for you, then you'll make it. If that isn't how it is for you, but you wish it were, then just talk to God about it. Hi, God, you're not so tasty to me right now. All these things about you, you know, especially, and I say this to him a lot, you know, I don't understand why you like this thing. Okay, but I'm at least talking to him. See the point? 
I don't like a lot of what God likes. Is that wrong? Yeah, I'm wrong. Okay, but what difference is that going to make? Until I like it, I'm not going to enjoy it. Well, how come God enjoys it? So I'm talking to him because I'm interested in him. And I don't like the fact that he likes something that I don't. And I don't like being different from him. And I don't like being distant from him. And I don't like not having the, the perspective he has on it. Notice what I didn't say in any of that. I didn't say I'm not a good person or I am a good person. I said I don't like. Because it's not about whether I'm good or bad. Christ paid for that 2,000 years ago. It's about God likes this thing. Why? Aren't you interested to know? Are you interested in Him? If you're interested in Him, you're going to want to conform to Him, like Paul talked about in Philippians, for the purpose of conforming to His death, that I may know Him for the purpose of conforming to His death. That's in Philippians 3. God, the goal of life, the happiness of life, is knowing God. Okay, but you don't feel that way at the beginning. But are you curious? That's a kind of interest. You're curious. Okay, use it. And if you're not curious, be honest about it and don't sweat it. Because in the final analysis, and this is the most important thing I can say in this whole audio, in the final analysis, it's not about whether you do the right thing or be the right person. It's about whether you get happy. Knowing God is happiness. If you're not willing to learn Him yet, fine, that's where you are with it. Don't sweat the fact that, well, I'm only good people like God and I don't like God so I'm a bad person. So what? Don't sweat that part. And if you are interested, it'll just naturally express itself and take advantage of it. And that's why using 1 John 1 9 is so important. So that you can actually get thoughts, as it were, because he's actually giving you ideas, thoughts, answers in reply to help you grow in your interest to help you grow in your confidence but not so much that the confidence is going to become a, a, a substitute enjoyment for God just knowing him is the whole point but do you want to yes moment one yes moment two no okay moment three yes okay you see the point? You have to sort of just dispense with the whole Christian thing about right, wrong. Or you'll get sidetracked the way Christians do. You want to know God, then you talk to Him. You don't want to know God, then you don't talk to Him. And here's the, the kicker that I want to leave you with on this audio. If you go from Genesis to Revelation... And you flip through any of those pages. Just flip through it. You'll notice that the book starts with God talking. When man is introduced, it starts with man talking to God and God talking back. Revelation ends with John talking and an angel talking and God talking and John hears the angel and John hears the God and John talks back and God talks back to John and God talks back to the angel and the angel talks back to God. They're all talking to each other directly. Religion says no to all that. Religion says that there must be some kind of, you know, barrier to direct communication and relationship. You're going to feel the urge to not talk to God. Partly because you're not interested. Partly because you feel it's a good, bad person issue, which it isn't. 
you're going to feel the urge not to talk to God, but to sort of like, oh, I got to do this, I got to do this, and then I get blessed, I do this and I get blessed, I do this and I get blessed, with no vertical communication whatsoever involved. Talking to God helps your interest, helps you focus, helps you learn whatever it is you're learning in your life or in Bible class today. And the best thing it's doing is it's a real, live, at that moment, relationship occurring. I mean, when you go home to your family, don't you enjoy seeing them? And some days, maybe not. And sometimes, boy, oh boy, it's really good to be alive just to see them. Why isn't it that way with God? And if it isn't that way with God, what's wrong? What's wrong is that there's an unhappiness, either at your end or somebody else's end, that there's no conversation occurring. So interest, content of what you're learning about God, inside and outside Bible class, and conversation is the tripod of spiritual integration with God. So if you find yourself not wanting to talk to God, not wanting to ask God questions, just like you would anybody else you care about, anybody else you're interested in, then if you're interested to do this, ask yourself why. What's bothering you? It's not about being a good person or a bad person. It's about your own happiness. See, you'll notice that in this integration, it's I for integration. And what we're integrating here, or talking about integrating here, is the self in relationship to God vertically. It's just the opposite of what Christianity keeps talking about. Christianity is all about doing for the world. The world, the world, the world. Lateral, lateral, lateral. Yeah, well, like Christ said, you can gain the whole world and lose your soul. Integrate with God first and then you'll be happy. And then whatever it is you happen to be doing in the body, he'll make good on that. Because he created the world, not you. And he'll make good on the world, whatever it is the world needs out of you. But if you don't integrate with him, then the happiness he wants for you, you're not going to have. And that happiness is built on three things. It's built on interest in him as a person. It's built on learning about him as a person through scripture. And all the vicissitudes that that entails, which are many and hard. And it's based on talking to him all the time. Because that's what relationship is, a conversation. You don't have those three pillars. Any one of those three parts of the tripod are missing. Or, or you know, let's, let's put it this way. They need to sort of stay in tandem. If there's a, if there's a problem in one of them, the others are going to be weakened by that. And you're going to be in danger of going the way of herdbound Christianity where you're just going through the motions and telling yourself you love God when you have absolutely no idea who he is. Now, maybe you want to go that way. Maybe that pleases you. Okay, fine. But if you don't, now you know the three parts in order to avoid going in that direction. One, are you interested? Do you want to know God just because of him? Answer, yes. Okay, now what? Well, then learn his book. And that's not easy. It's easier than a lot of people think. Because people barnacle it with all kinds of stuff that you have to go through in order to learn the good parts. And then third thing, the whole time, talk to them. In your head, when your other people are around, and out loud if you feel like it, when you're alone. And you'll make it. If you're worried about, you know, becoming a good person, he'll turn you into one. If not, by the time you're dead, when you're dead. And you don't have to worry about whatever it is he's going to do with your body to the human race to make good on you in the world. He'll do it. You don't have to. And you wouldn't even know how. 
And you weren't created. Just like Adam was created in the garden, there were no works in the garden. There was no social agenda that Adam had to fulfill. Adam played at naming the animals. God gave, God had talked talk to Adam every day, and Adam just plucked food from the tree whenever he felt like eating, and played with the animals. There were no works. So you were not created to work. You were created to have a relationship. God wants you to enjoy Him. God wants you to have a relationship with Him. Do you want it? If yes, then do those three things. And He'll take care of the rest. Just like He did for Adam. Peace out.